All right, well, we have made it all the way to the main presentation. Um, Andy, did we decide we were going to go with, yeah, we decided we we're going to go with Richard first. So, right, we're going to have a bunch of rapid fire show and tell presentations from, from members. Um, Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, so one of the things that we discussed at, uh, at the officers meeting, and I'm, uh, I am your experiments officer, which is sort of a new- Experiments. Experiments, yes, a new uh, type of position, and we're trying to figure out how you know, we can work this into the group. We're all experimenters, right? Because when you homebrew, you're always trying different things, and so, we also thought about doing uh, short talks. And so I'm just gonna do a short talk and, uh, on one uh, particular experiment that uh, occurs with this group, which most of you have probably heard about, called Brewlosophy, a group of guys and, and, uh, and women who are in a brew club, and they decided to basically you know, put together a website, and they, decided to start doing ex essentially experiments on brewing where they're trying to isolate as much as possible single factors. And um, so I just, this slide is really just to give you an introduction to, the, to their website and only the experiments website. There's actually a lot of other information on there um, that I encourage you to check out. Um, but they have this experiments page, and let's see. So if you look up here, all, these are all the, the names of them. This is the type. They have basically three different kinds. There's process, ingredients, or um, uh, what is the other third type? Process, ingredients, equipment, excuse me. And to date, they started doing this like in 2014. They've actually got like 387 of these different things up there. And what's interesting, you can filter these. Uh, and in addition to the type and the date, they have uh, what's called here a p-value. And this is uh, just a statistical um, number uh, that they use in the, in the results when they actually test their beer. So a lot of you are familiar with triangle tests where you get two beers of one type, <clears throat> one beer of a second type in an opaque glass. You don't know, you're not, basically you're not supposed to know anything about what it is. And you try to see if you can taste the difference between those two beers. And <clears throat> so in this case, you know, they've got all these different uh, comparisons that they're doing. And some of them are, are really, uh, interesting, but and anyways, all I wanted to do was put up here. You know, if you're if you this is the value that they're really looking for, um, and so they're usually trying to get something like between ten and twenty people to do these, and they'll tell you in the results like, okay, to get to this O5 level, which means that there's a one in twenty chance that the difference could be random. Okay. So that's a pretty good level, and this is this is a high. This is like a very commonly used statistics in um, biology and social sciences, um, and so you'll see that out there. But like, if it's a 0.1, it means well, it's a one in ten. You know, if you're a 0.05, you know, now it's a one in two hundred chance that the difference that you detected could occur by ran, uh, random probability. So that's a that's a really high number. So you can kind of see here right away that there's a bunch of different ones that um, you know aren't meeting uh, uh, the cutoffs, and then there's other ones that uh, that are like dry hopping versus keg hopping and Irish uh, IPA, extract versus all grain American stout. Okay, and and some of these won't surprise you. 
but other ones might surprise you. And so I wanted to um, talk about this one particular, I hope you guys can see the screen. Um, this one particular one, so I looked at the experiments that they did this past year, and uh, unfortunately due to COVID, you know, it's really kind of impacted them in terms of the testing that they can do. But at the same time, um, I think, you know, they're, they're still definitely worth talking about. So there's usually a little preamble to like, you know, they have a paragraph, well, why did I choose this, to do this experiment? And, um, you know, this uh, fellow, um, said, oh, well, there was another experiment on flame out uh, hop stand versus chilled hop stand, and it came out non-significant. And it seems like this has been, to me, like a big thing. Like a lot of people are really into doing uh, now cooling their warts before they're putting in aroma hops at the end. Um, and, you know, we all believe that that's like giving us this big uh, effect, uh, partially because if you get down below this temperature, you're not isomerizing any alpha acids anymore. So you're definitely not adding any bitterness to your beer. So you could put in a, a lot of hops if you wanted. And it should also be below the temperature that you're volatilizing any um, uh, terpenes, any of the oils that are in your hops. So it just kind of makes sense, right? It's like, okay, it, all that goodness is going into my beer. Uh, so the way that the, it, it's, you know, it's, it's one continuous thing that you can scroll through. And for those that you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. But it, he'll, he'll talk about the, the recipe details. So in this case, he's got something he's calling a Midwest IPA. He's using citrus, um, uh, imperial ale yeast. Uh, I skipped the grain bill just in the interest of time, uh, but I did want to point out actually the hops because, um, so here's his schedule and he's using this hop called Talus, which I haven't used before, but it, it's, it's one of the HPC experimentals that was just named like maybe in the last year or two. And it turns out that it's a sister of Sabro, or actually I think it's a, 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 a progeny of Sabro. So it was Sabro that was open pollinated. They took all the seeds, planted them out, grew up all those hop plants, and then they selected another one. And it's got some properties of Sabro, um, like uh, this intense wood, um, coconut that people have picked up a lot on with Sabro. So, and then the only, I highlighted this. So in addition to doing the aroma addition, he's also uh, done a dry hop on this beer. So these are the characteristics uh, of those hops. And then as you go down the page, you'll see what they love to do is to try and show you that they're getting as close as possible to um, uh, identical uh, specs for their beer. So, you know, the mash in temperatures, okay, they're one degree off. And then they'll show a few other things and oftentimes they will show a picture of their hydrometer showing that they're, you know, where did they get? Are they getting to the uh, same exact uh, original gravity or, or is it off? And that kind of helps you evaluate, you know, are they doing a really good job on trying to control the variables in the experiment? And so then at the end, uh, of course, they have results and oftentimes they'll show you uh, side by side pictures. So on the left is the flame out, the right is the 120. You know, in this case, I don't know that we would expect to see any differences, but they'll also talk about how they carbonated it and things like that. And then, of course, um, you know, the way they're supposed to do this is triangle tests. Now, here's one significant caveat to this particular experiment is that it was, this is from uh, January of last year, and uh, he decided to, I think he, he got... Um, uh, a friend or somebody to help him do this, but basically he's doing semi-blind triangle tests, just one person. Now, normally you would have like, you know, 10 to 20 people. And uh, so in this, um, he basically did 10 semi-blinds and what he, uh, what he figured out is that he needs at least seven to get a p-value of uh, 0.05. So uh, in order to reach, uh, you know, this, this common 
uh, rule of thumb, I guess you could call it statistical significance. And he ended up only being able to hit three times, so that's a P of 0.7, and that's basically like flip, almost flip a coin or worse. So he did not be, he was not able to detect any difference, and so then the, the conclusion that he gets here is that flameout is not detectably different from a hop stand at 129. And I, I picked it out because I was surprised. Um, I've just heard so much about how doing these lower, um, you know, cool your wart, put your hops in then, you know, you're going to keep all that goodness in there. But um, of course, with every experiment, there's always, there's a design to it, there's variables. So, um, you know, he did have a big dry hop on it. Uh, and so I was just uh, kind of curious uh, if anybody had any thoughts. Improvements to the experimental design. But one thing I noticed on a lot of these brulosophy experiments is that they're actually like, um, uh, they'll actually say in there, you know, I, there was this other philosophy experiment, and they'll have a link to it and say, well, I didn't quite believe it, so I decided to do it again, you know, using a different recipe or a, a different method. And so, you know, I think that those would be fun and interesting things to try and do, and I encourage everybody to check out um, the page, but that's, that's my short talk. No, I think your your point about them having um, a lot of hop additions after that flame out period could mask the could potentially mask the differences in the hop character. Right. So yeah, that I could see where you might want to do that sort of back off on that to keep the differences isolated and not masked. Yeah, cool. All right, so we're going to continue with our show and tell. Thank you, Richard. I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to tell people who's on deck, because that might help people to be prepared. So Lauren's up, up next. Uh, he already knew that, though. So, And then uh, um, uh, Chris, you're up, uh, you're up net. You're on deck. So you're Chris, Chris uh, Van Hammersfeld is up, is up on deck. So um, we have the. You have it, okay. Yeah, you wanna do, okay, go ahead. So I'm gonna talk about the one and only amazing Furfur. Wow. <laughs> and Judy, Judy's, gonna, Judy's gonna hand something out. Um, this is a tool that I invented. It's really, it's really freaking expensive. Um, it is. What is a furfur? It is a quarter twenty thread, quarter three quarter inch long hex head stainless steel screw. Don't give up the formula. With, with a stainless steel lock nut that has an, a nylon insert. Why? Why? Stop, I don't know. So, um, this is a tool that I use all the time in my brewery, and it has to do with um, handling quick disconnect um, fittings and things that they're connected to, right? So um, you'll notice, that's okay. You'll notice that this screw is, is screwed into the nut and it's uh, a little hard to see but it's less than proud. It's a, it's a little bit, um, it's not even flush with the nylon, a little less than proud. That's important. What the heck is it good for? It's good for all kinds of things, which is why it's called a, a fur fur. It's good for this and it's good for that. When you have a ball lock fitting or a pin lock fitting, and you want to um, rinse one that you just just used, stick your fur fur in it and it makes it really easy to depress the poppet. You still have room, room to uh, pass warm slash hot or cold liquid through it to rinse it out. And you get a really nice cool rinse. And um, also, 
once you're done rinsing and or cleaning your <clears throat> connector, your quick disconnect, I am sanitizing. It helps with sanitizing because, as I uh, want to do, I will get a little bit of sanitizer, just enough to immerse one of these little puppies. And then when you dip it in the sanitizer, you can actually make sure that there's no bubbles even, that's completely immersed with your sanitizer. I usually immerse it once, empty it, immerse it again. You got 100% um, uh, the full concentration of sanitizer in that fitting, all right? Um, the other really cool thing about using a fur for uh, the way to use them um, is with purging and priming of lines. So um, I'm kind of, I'll say anal about no oxygen touching my beer product um, after it goes into the fermenter. Um, so for um, beer transfers, anytime you're going to a destination that has a ball lock fitting on it, um, you can purge the line first with either CO2 or, or beer to make sure that there's no oxygen in that line before you connect it up to your destination keg. Really handy for that. Um, also, another way to use them uh, for purging and priming is anytime you hook up CO2 lines to a uh, CO2 tank or any time you change out your CO2 tank. Before you connect the, the um, quick disconnect to uh, the, the gas in on your, on, your, on your kegs to either serve or, or push beer from one keg to another, whatever it is, you want to make sure that there's no oxygen in that line. And if you just change out the keg or a fitting on your CO2 setup, always purge let it bleed out and get full CO2 in the lines. Um, one other quick comment is that the three quarter inch length on this uh, screw or bolt, we can call it either one, I guess. Uh, the screw is um, on a, for you pin heads out there, I know we still have some, Andy. Um, the poppet is a little bit deeper in the connector on a, on, a, on a pin lock. And so you probably want to go with a one inch screw if you want a, a fur fur for your pin locks. Any questions on my fur fur? Chris says he's going to use it tomorrow. Awesome. I hope, I hope um, uh, it helps you keep oxygen um, out of your beer. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. All right, Chris is, Chris, uh, is gonna be up ne uh, next, and on deck is John Edstrom. Um, one quick thing I forgot to mention, I was talking about sanitizing. Um, once you have it full of sanitizer and it's sat in there for a minute or 10 minutes, whatever it is, um, one of the things about sanitizing things is that um, if you read the directions, it says you want to dry out or let dry whatever it is you just sanitized. So the furfur is really good for um, emptying the sanitizer out, and if you shake it out, you get it almost dry all, already, and then you, I always leave mine out to dry the rest of the way. Cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Chris, uh, my first time presenting here. Thank you very much. I'm gonna be uh, showing a piece of equipment as well. Uh, this last summer, I got the opportunity to buy Nick's world famous brew house, the one that he became a two-time champion with. I am really excited about this system. I know, now I have to brew. Oh, it's amazing, it does the job all by itself. I don't have to do anything but throw malt in and, and out comes great beer. It is. Uh, the box that Nick has on the table there, that was the old Herms controller. And so with, uh, with that, uh, it would 
control the, uh, the gas manifold on the hot liquor tank. So the, um, the, the sparge arm would be um, plugged in through the, the Herms coil and heating the mash to whatever temperature that box said. That box, though, has a really weird uh, short or some ghost in it. And so anytime the temperature dropped too low, it would decide to not turn on the, uh, the gas. So you just give it a little tap, and all of a sudden it would, uh, it would light the gas up. Every time, it was actually like it was designed. You just tap it anywhere on the box, and it would heat the gas up. The only problem with that was I wasn't sure if that really was a ghost or if there was a problem and I'd be in the middle of a mash and all of a sudden tap, 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 no gas. And so Nick suggested I switch from that box to using an ink bird. And we've all used ink birds on, on our fermenters or on our, um, on our refrigerators, our keezers. Um, so it's a great little device for controlling temperature. Uh, it has a little thermometer that you can plug in anywhere, and, and it has a great temperature range on it. So the, the next step was figuring out how to put an ink bird into this existing Herm system. And so that's where this part came in. It's a, it's a little T, and this was a part that Nick already had on his sparge arm, and I'm going to try to do this with a microphone and a sparge arm. So he had the spark, he had this T already plugged in on the the hot the hot liquid would come in out of the mash through the herms coil and then into the spar jar and it would just keep recirculating for the entire hour or an hour long you're doing your mash. Plugged into the T was a PID um, or a, a, an electronic thermometer that they originally had on this T. And that was where if you tap on that box, it will sense the temperature from this and turn the gas on. So I had to convert this T into using an ink bird. And to do that, I had to buy a thermal well that the little ink bird uh, thermometer could go into. And that, so I had to try a couple different sizes out. This was the big one. And so this one fit all the way through the T. And you can see that it actually went all the way into um, into the disconnect. So this hose would, would come in from the side and this would go off to the Herms coil. The problem was <clears throat> with this long one, it was actually completely filling the inside of the tool and completely blocking the, the, uh, the liquid from going through it, the work from going through it. And I discovered that fortunately the day before it was and I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? I actually hooked up that box again and did, did my brew day that day because this one was too long. What's inside of here now is one that is, I think it's a 50 millimeter, and I tried a 30 millimeter short one in there. And the short one, um, if you use the ink bird, um, you've probably seen the temperature click up a couple points and click down a couple points. It's actually kind of slow in how it measures temperature. And it's actually a little too slow for measuring the herbs. So when I'm trying to bring, bring up my mash to an exactly a temperature point, whether it's 145 or 111 or uh, wherever it is, as the, the wort is going through the system, the ink bird is a little slow at sensing the temperature. So what I'll do is I'll set the ink bird to the exact temperature that I want, and then when it's within about four or five degrees of that target point, I'll turn off the ink bird and just let the system continue to heat. And I'll put my, my thermal pen right on the wort as it's coming out of the sparge arm until it hits the exact point. And then I'll flip the, um, the ink bird back on, and the ink bird is usually right in agreement with what the thermal pen is. Now the ink bird, I had to, uh, to calibrate it. So the, the temperature that it's sensing through this there's a bunch of metal here, there's ambient air that's cooled it down. I had to calibrate the ink bird, but I was able to get the ink bird to be in exact agreement with my thermal pen. The only thing then is the ink bird is still a little slow, maybe about 30 to, 30 to 60 seconds slower than it should be. So if I just let it run the gas all the way until I get 111, I got coasting. Coast up to maybe 115, 118. 
So that's where uh, shutting it off a little early allows that posting to occur uh, right at the point where I want it. So this part right here, along with the little thermal well in there, has made brew day so much easier. So I'm actually hitting efficiencies that are like through the roof now uh, on my, my mash conversion. So any questions? Yes. Oh, oh, sorry. So the uh, the firms, so the, the from the mash it goes into a coil in a hot liquor tank. Yes. And yeah. Then, so it come, comes out of out of the bottom of the mash, um, and I pump it up through the firms coil that's in the hot liquor tank. So the hot liquor tank is what's being heated. So the the wort's not being heated directly. And then the very last point before the wort enters the re-enters the mash is that temperature probe and then through this arm and on onto the top of the curtain. So, so what do you keep your hot liquor tank at, like 180 or 200 or? It, it depends on um, what point I'm trying to hit the mash. So uh, it, I find it, Nick, I don't know what, what you're hitting, I find that it's about 10 degrees hotter in the hot liquor tank from what my mash target is. So the, the hot liquor tank actually is a, a variable temperature uh, depending on what temperature point I'm trying to get, all the way up to mash out at 170, hot liquor is maybe at 180. So it wouldn't help. So it wouldn't help you to have it at 200 to, to reach your temperature quicker. That doesn't doesn't work that way. But the the inker is not controlling the pump. So if, yeah. if it was a matter of uh, um, just heat up my hot liquor tank to 190 degrees, then I'd have to control the pump because I wouldn't want. Um, all of that hot temperature making its way back into the ward. Instead, I'm controlling just the temperature of the circulation. Okay. Did you find it was 10 degrees? No. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Any other questions? And sorry, I don't have slides. The other side. And sh and show and tell. See, uh, John Edstrom is up next, and then on deck we have, hang on a sec, um, myself, Andy Gallen. Okay. Unfortunately. I know. I wish I could have brought some logger for you all to try, because... Andy asked me a week ago, would you present? And I was like, crap, it just went in the fermenter. So it'll be ready in a, about two and a half weeks, maybe three. So I'll bring it to the next meeting. Sorry. But uh, brewing light lagers was kind of a must for me just because, unfortunately, my wife does not like any other beer other than Coors Light, unfortunately. And really, it hurt me deep inside. And... It really bothered me greatly, so I was like, crap, how am I going to make this work? So I decided, okay, well, what the heck, let's give it a go and see if this works and try to make some light American lagers. But I was like, ugh, I just don't like this beer that much. But we'll try it out. So, I don't know, can you get any of the slides to load, Andy? Or, or, or do I need to hit the clicker? Cool. Sorry, I'm used to different format where I teach normally. All right, here we go. So I just did a quick look it up. American Light Lagers, highly carbonated. We've all had Coors Light, Miller Light, whatever. They all kind of taste very similar, very light straw colored, and hated on beers from the beer snobs of the craft beer community. We all, everybody likes to hate on these beers, but they're actually quite difficult to brew because they're really hard to hide anything behind. <laughs> So you really have to be super, super careful with all your different techniques as well as all your sanitization as well as your fermentation temperatures. But I kind of been, speaking of brewlosophy, like we talked about earlier, I saw their quick fermentation schedule and I thought, well, I'll give this a try and see how it works. But usually OGs are usually around one, about 1028 to 1040. I usually do Coors Light around, or the, my, the one I jokingly call Rue Light because my wife's name is Rue Ann. So I call it Rue Light. I actually have the recipe in a couple slides. I'll show it to y'all. Um, but I found an idea of it, kind of got some ideas online of some 
things some folks had done. I'm like, all right, I'm going to give this a go and see what happens. Um, but obviously very, very low ABV and everything else. So it's actually fairly cheap to brew, but uh, not a lot to hide behind. Uh, usually I chill the wort to around four, 48 to 53 degrees, so I usually will do my brew day like you normally do any of your normal brew days. But a lot of times because I'm trying to get max efficiency out of such low amount of malt, I will, like Friday, I'll throw it all in my SS Brewtech mash tun and let it mash overnight. So I will dough in at about 150 to 151 degrees, throw the lid on and go to bed because I'm usually exhausted after a week and I will hit it first thing Saturday morning and usually only drops around five to six degrees by morning. And so that's when I will then take that wart off and uh, recirculate it through my uh, rim system that I have and then put it in boil up and, and then pitch. I usually use either Tetanang or I'll use uh, Haltar Blanc depending on what noble hop I really feel like using, but usually one of those. And I will let it go in the fermenter for a day or half overnight, uh, try to get it chilled all the way down because from what I've read, if you look at the actual microbiology of, of yeast, the first 12 to 24 hours to up to 72 hours is where you have the lag phase in yeast where it's reproducing because it's, it's budding, it's not doing mitosis, it's, it's budding is when it's reproduction. And so because it's doing that, it's creating a lot of the off flavors. And so try to make sure I maintain the temperature as best as I can. So if anybody sees a Sanyo 4912 model refrigerator on Craigslist, snatch that up because they don't make that one anymore. But it's super, super convenient. I found one in Orange County. I bought that about a year ago, year and a half ago. And that's when I started making loggers because I just hooked up an ink bird to it and it doesn't have a freezer on it. And it's a 5.2 cubic foot refrigerator and I'm able to fit a SS Brutech brew bucket right in there, no problems whatsoever. And I'm able to hold the temperature with my ink bird right at about 50 to 52 degrees. And I let it roll for about a week at that temperature. Um, and then I will, after seven days or so, I'll increase the temp by five degrees a day to get it to the diacetyl rest. Let it go for, I just check the SG, or see what the final gravity is, I should say, the FG. See where I'm at, if I've reached about where I want it to be. I will just start dropping it down to lager temperatures and I'll pitch some gelatin in there to clean it up a little bit. I think it was last month, no, two months ago, I served that uh, Magic Grits lager that I just kind of, for the heck of it, tried because my wife's like, hey, do you want to brew tomorrow? I'm like, oh, great. I don't, didn't plan, but sure, why not? And that's what I made. And it turned out really good. Dropped the beer down to about 37 and pitched gelatin and let the beer lager for a couple weeks and keg. And when we did the uh, big brew session for... Uh, five suits for the American wheat lager. I used the Bohemian lager yeast in that and was able to have a good lager ready to go for the thing in a month using this method. So it doesn't take too, too long. And this is my recipe, if you can kind of see, for the roulette. It is just five pounds of good old two-row German Pilsner, two pounds of six-row, and then two pounds each of corn and rice. And that's it. And then you can use either 34, I usually use 3470, but um, pitch two, two dry packs and it is, it is fast, it goes quick. It's mostly done even before I start raising the temperature up. And it really, really makes a super crushable, light, drinkable beer that tastes way better than Coors Light. And what I enjoy is the fact that my wife will actually have a beer with me rather than go, can you go buy me some Coors Light? And I just go, yes, sweetie, I will. Yes, of course I say yes, but it, it, hurts, me, it hurts me in my heart. So every summer I usually tend to, and most of the year I tend to have this on tap. I just happen to not have it on tap right now. But any questions? Sure, sure Chris. It's both to do fermentation as well as diacetyl. Yes. So I leave it at 65 for as long as it takes to finish fermentation. So I let it go for a week or so, depending on the, like when I did that Baltic Porter I served at last meeting, 
I let that go for two weeks at about 50 degrees, and then I did the same method where I bumped it all the way up to 65, and I let it go for a few days. Um, and then it finished, finished pretty quickly at that temperature. But that's why I bump it all the way up to that temperature. What was your question, Sam? That's been on my to-do list because I, I have a big enough system I can do a 10 or 12 gallon batch, no problem. And I've been thinking about doing that because I did that with the same beer, but I used um, an American ale yeast. I think I used California law, or California ale, like 001. And I also used 3470 in it. And you could definitely tell which one was the ale yeast and which one was the lager yeast very, very easily. Because it didn't have that crisp, you know, that that, I don't know, that, unique lager finish that you get out of lagers. It just didn't have that in the ale. And so I might give that a try. I just haven't done that yet. Okay, by all means. But I think that I just had one more slide of, yeah, this was uh, the end of, uh, yeah, Tetanang. One, at six, one ounce at 60 and one ounce at five minutes. And sometimes I just do one ounce total and that's it and it works out just fine too. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm up. And I'm supposed to say who's on deck, too. That's what I'm supposed to say, who's on deck. Well, let's see. Uh, on deck is Todd. Todd's on deck. <clears throat> Todd, I... I brought in, a, Todd, you asked me to bring in a, a, an extra CO2 cylinder. I brought one in that's back there, right, right in the back over here, back where you are. Yeah, so you can bring that up if you want. Yeah, so um, real quick, what I was just going to show you is that, you know, uh, bringing beer a lot of different places, and it's always kind of a chore, and, you know, you're bringing bottles or you're doing this kind of stuff. And so what I decided to do was to make the, the smallest draft system that I could. And so I wanted to share with you guys because it's been a lot of fun. And, and we've actually been talking about uh, doing a, uh, a build day for our club where we could get all the uh, materials to build these things. If you guys want uh, us to sign up for it, we'd show up on a, on a Saturday or something like that and have all the materials there and just build them up. And then you, you go home with one of these things. And so um, I'll show you basically the way that it works. Um, is I have a, a paintball canister here. So it's a paintball canister here, and you can get these filled up for, with CO2. They're, it's not very expensive. I think it cost me $5 to fill this up. And um, if, you're just, if you're not carbonating beer and you're just pushing beer out, this thing will do kegs upon kegs upon kegs. So it lasts a long time. I actually have two of them because I'm always worried I'm going to run out of, of one and then, you know, uh, it'll be panic. And so, um, but you can, you can weigh, you know, you can weigh them and you can see how many grams you use, you know, every time and you can know how much about how much you're going to lose on it. Um, we went out, I brought this out to uh, the uh, November Fest and we had a, a little scare and I thought we ran out of CO2, but it turned out I just didn't have this thing uh, uh, on all the way at the top. In order to save space, you, uh, um, you, uh, uh, you can build something like this. This has a fitting on it. It has a regulator on here. You set the pressure once. You really don't need to do anything else with it because you're just driving beer out with it. And so you don't have to bring this with you everywhere. And that, that basically, be, without the gauges on there, you can put it in a, in a, uh, a smaller cooler. Um, if you look at the paintball canister, there's a fitting on it that you can get um, that will allow it to, uh, you know, to fit into your regulator fitting. And so you, uh, um, or this guy right here, this fitting right here, you get this fitting right there and then, and then, you, can, uh, uh, then you can actually connect directly up to the paintball 
canister like this. And so now you basically have CO2 on the road. And you could do this if you didn't want to do one of these setups and you just didn't want to bring your... Oop. I've done here. Hang on a sec. Oh, you like? Yeah. We can steal one from here. I don't know if that'll fit. That might be a little too small. Do you have extra washers at home? Well, I have extra washers at home. But uh, I have I have extra washers at home, but it looks like it looks like I've done something with the washer here. It was on this. The O-ring. Um, but anyway, so uh, let me show you. I'll just show you what we got going here. So So you get a little uh, small keg. So this is a 1.75 gallon keg. And so it's basically it's the same draft system that you, nor that you would use at home, but everything's just smaller. Uh, this, the, uh, the faucet, everything's the, the same thing that, that use the regular quick disconnects, all that kind of stuff. But you can get a, a cooler that this will all fit into, build it all in there, and then have something that's super compact. And it's nice you bring it out to you know, uh, uh, small events and things like that or events where there's going to be a lot of different beers and you're not going to go through that much of it. So, um, so that's it. That's, a, that's basically the system. Any, any questions on it? Patrick has a question. Yeah, build day. We're going to do a build day. We'll figure out the ingredients. We'll get sign-ups and then we'll tell you what the cost is going to be. And then if you want to build one, all the stuff will be there for you. So we're planning on that for probably later in the, later in the year. Chris? I don't think Matheson will do them, uh, but you can go to paintball shops and to do them. You know, or you, or you, can, you, you can make your own setup to do it, but you have to like, I think you have to invert the CO2 keg so that you want, you want to fill it with liquid CO2. Um, but, but it's just, it's so cheap enough just to go to the paintball stores and do it. They last so long. David? Okay. It's uh, not as you. You th do you think it's uh, not as clean as welding uh, CO two? Yes. Welding CO two. You think welding CO two would be cleaner? Yeah. yeah. You, you, need, you probably need one of those. Uh, one of those stations will last you a very long time. Todd had a question. This is 1.75 gallons, actually. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you can get them. I forget. You, you know exactly where where to get. You can get them. Uh, there's places that sell them. 1.75 gallon. The thing is, the funny thing is, this will cost you the same price as a five gallon keg. You know, but. You want something compact, so you know, so you do it. Yeah, Sean. Okay, could be. I don't know. I, uh, somebody else had a question over here. Rob. Oh yeah, so the, this is just a regular, the regular regulator where I took the uh, gauges off of it. So you can just get the, the you know, cheap regulator, uh, take gauges off of it, and then you put um, this fitting right here. I think I got it at Williams Brewing or something like that. That it's a paintball canister fitting that's made for doing this. You know, but your alternative is to get the, I don't know if you guys seen the, the little tiny regulator that's like this big that run, you know, the, the, the thing is, it's super expensive. You know, this is a lot lower cost than that, you know, and it's standard equipment, so. Justin, I think you had a question. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Randy.
to check the air gap. So I had to go where I I know that Williams Brewing has just released a regulator. They have a, they used to have a regulator for the, the paintball tanks. They just released one for the soda stream tanks that screws on the top, so it's got the built-in regulator and everything. Yeah, and, 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 and you can buy those at Bed Bath & Beyond or take them back and exchange them out. You can't refill them yourselves, but Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Staples, and a whole bunch of other places carry soda stream products. You can swap the tanks out with them all the time. All set? All set? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I, I'm here to talk about canning homebrew. Um, so from, uh, where's that little clicker? Oh, that's okay. uh, so um, I got this from uh, Kegland. It's their cannular uh, uh, can seamer. I think they're an Australian company, and I bought it about two years ago, and I've done like, I think about nine uh, batches on it. So um, I'll kind of give you, you know, my idea of uh, what I found with it. I, I wish Candy, I didn't know Candy was leaving. She's actually the pro, so she could probably tell us the, the real deal. But anyway, can we switch one head, one slide ahead? What do I do? Do I do this? Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, you'll see here, this is, uh, oh shit, <laughs> I'm wasting all my time. Here we go. Okay, so here is kind of, you know, because it's kind of small, I thought I'd give you an overview here. It's just, it comes basically put together. All you have to do is add on this little arm and then put this little table together. That's all you need to do. Um, and from there, this is the stand uh, where you put the beer, you know, and then you push this little arm in and it, and it pushes the can, uh, can up, and then you can do the seaming, seaming process. But this little table, it's just like a little plastic piece that drops in, and you can buy a larger piece that does 12 ounce cans if you want. And right out of the box, it works with their own cans, cannular, it's like 16.9 ounces. Um, so I did it that way, and sure enough, on the first batch, it worked completely fine. I never had to adjust anything or make any uh, any uh, changes to it. And then, the, so this is the business end of it. Um, so you're kind of looking up at the bottom of it right here. The can kind of fits right in here and then it's a two seam, a two, you know, step operation. First it like folds the, the, the top onto the can and then it crushes, oh actually this is the first one. And then the second one, it kind of crushes it all together and makes it airtight. So you can kind of see it here, the can body, the, t the lid, and then the second one just squeezes it all together right here. So um, I'll kind of go over how I do it, my how I do it, and it's worked okay, okay for me so far. So first of all, I use two uh, CO2 um, cans. The first one I use a beer gun, and the first one is to purge. So I, I put uh, the uh, one CO2 in here, and I put it at like 10 psi, so you can purge the purge the can. And then the second one, I run to, your be to the beer, and that one I do it like two PSI, as low as humanly possible. Bleed all the gas off, make it go as low as you possibly can. Because if you try to fill it like, you know, quickly or warm beer, it just foams right up and it's like a complete and total nightmare. So you just put it at like two PSI, here's the can, here's the top. So I fill it like three quarters of the way full of sanitizer, put the top on it, flip it up, so it, the whole thing kind of gets sanitized. Put the lid here, then I fill it with the beer gun, and then you put it on to the, after you filled it, put it on here, and usually it, it like foams up over the top. So then you put the top on and kind of push the foam out so that there's no, no oxygen in there whatsoever. Put it on there, rotate the, the stand up so that it goes into that chuck right there, and then it's uh, a two-step process. You hit the first one this way, and then the second one this way, which seems it shut. And that's it. And that's the total operation of the whole thing. 
So the few things that I've kind of learned along the way, I mean, I really like it because it's super easy. I have some homebrew buddies in Chicago and we exchange beer a lot. So it's super easy just to, I used to wrap each bottle in, you know, um, uh, bubble wrap and then wrap the whole thing in bubble wrap and send this gigantic thing. It was like 60 bucks to get, you know, six beers to Chicago. And this is super easy. I just put them in those little um, plastic, you know, six pack holder snap rings and then bubble wrap that and ship it off. It's like half the cost. Um, it's easy if you want to go to a, like a party or something. You can, you know, just bring a couple beers rather than a growler and leave them with them so they can have those cans afterward. Um, but there's, <laughs> after like my third batch, I had, you know, I'm, I'm canning away. I'm, you know, very happy with it. After the third batch, I did like six beers and I look and out of the top, they're all sitting here on lined up that I've done. And out of the top, there's beer like oozing out of the seam. And I'm like, oh shit. And I'm like, there's nothing you can do. You can't really pour it back in the keg. I guess you could pour it back in the keg, but probably not a good idea. You can't, you know, it's seam, so you can't, you know, cut it. Yeah. So I'm like, shit. So I call my wife. I'm like, you know, she was in the other room. I'm like, it was noon on a Sunday. I'm like, we got to drink six beers. And she like, she's like, what? She's like, it's noon on Sunday. And I'm like, well, make sandwiches. I mean, we got six beers to drink. So what I learned is that the, the thing kind of uh, wears down the, the, I think it's the chuck in the middle, kind of wears down a little. And there's a slight adjustment that you can make in the stand to like lift it up a little higher. And then it works. So like every like third or fourth batch, it seems like I kind of have to adjust it just a little bit. But other than that, it looks fine. So now after I do the first can, I shake the shit out of it and then look to see if it it's oozes out. If it oozes out, then, you know, I know I got to adjust it. If not, you can just keep ripping through it. And uh, the bad thing about it is it's expensive. Um, I buy them like, uh, they sell them 200 cans a piece, and it, so it's like, it's like 25 cents a can. So it's real expensive. I'm hoping that comes down. But, and then it also takes up a lot of space because the cans. Oh, oh, I'm glad I bought a whole, I bought 200 a couple months ago, so maybe that'll last me through the year. But Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. I don't have five truckloads, but the box is huge, so it has to sit somewhere, and it takes up a lot of space. But otherwise, I really like it. I, you know, it's a lot of fun. And what I'll do is I can't do it right now because it's it's kind of take it's kind of gangly, and it takes a little bit to set it up. But I'll I'll uh, can a couple of Andy's beers, and we'll raffle them off and give them away. And then you can kind of see a little closer how it works if if anybody's interested. So. Yeah. 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 I guess all these, this chuck and these two rollers, I guess, are, you can buy them individually um, from, you know, and they gave, they gave some number, you know, the lifetime of it, but I don't remember what it was. So, so. Yeah. The first couple batches that I did, I was like, I would like, you know, as I was using the beer gun, it would get sort of close and I'd stop. Another thing that I, I found out was um, I put it on a scale and then I, I know, because it's kind of hard to tell where you are because there's foam on the top and, you know, so I put it on a scale and it like 515 grams is like right in the spot. So even if foam's coming off a little bit, I kind of know where, right where the top is. And as long as there's foam on there and you slap the top on, it, you know, I've, I've had a couple that have had a month or so later, and I didn't notice anything bad, but, you know. Sam? Have you tried No. 16 ounces of cocktail. I like that. <laughs> no, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Chris? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you don't, like I said, when it starts foaming over, I also have rags that I wipe the can down when you put it in there, because when you turn it on, it just throws sh shit everywhere. So you can also put it on here, it just, like, it goes on these two screws. It's an additional piece that goes in front of there, but I haven't bought it yet, but I just wear an old t-shirt. and <laughs> So, all right, thank you.
Okay, so we've got uh, Greg up next, and then uh, on deck is Jacques. Okay, sorry about my wheeled presence. Um, and I've got some notes. I'm talking to you about flavor tonight, so don't expect a lot of technical stuff from me. Um, I want to start talking about inspiration. And when I do flavors, um, I get inspiration from the competitions we have. When we were at uh, Booze Brothers and we had Coles delivered to us. And you're going to do something with that or at Five Suits and we get Hef uh, sent to us. And so I just think about, you know, the competitions we have. When you go around different breweries and you taste different beers, you think, oh, yeah, and that's what you're drinking uh, now with the stout. Uh, my wife and I went down to Pure Projects, and she loved their Log Cabin series. And we've been going down for their once weekly beer tasting and they had their river of truth. And she said, oh my God, stop doing that one and let's do this one. And so, you know, you get inspired by, you know, where you are and, and what you're around. So um, that's where, you know, flavor comes from me from cooking and my, just my perception of it. Um, talking about when I get beer, like from, from Booze Brothers and I have a Kolsch and I'm thinking, well, what am I gonna do with it? And I, I came up with German chocolate cake that year and it turned out to be a, a, a beer that a lot of people liked. And what I ended up doing with it is changing the basic recipe. So when I get something light and like that, like a Kolsch or a, a lager or a Pilsner, I often will do a beer in a bag and I'll add some grain to it. So like I took a Kolsch and I add a little victory and white wheat to it. Um, so just something to give it a little bit extra body that might go toward a profile that I'm going to aim for. Uh, I discovered that lighter beers work better. Andy came up to me and told me about a German chocolate cake he's doing that is a stout. And you have all those darker grains and you get a lot of that sort of flavor in it. So, you know, if you're just looking for a straight flavor, then, you know, the lighter beers work out a little bit better. Um, so what I've discovered with all my flavor, it's late. It's in secondary. Uh, I don't do anything in, in the boil, and Andy and I were just talking about that. Uh, I don't know the chemistry with it all, but I figure that the heat's just going to burn everything off. And so I like to have stuff fresh, and I put it in secondary. Um, I do it kind of late, oftentimes right before kegging. And some of you had my German chocolate cake tonight, and my wife and I were tasting that all the way through, and we decided, gosh, you know, there's not enough cake in it, so we need some more pecan, and we need some more cocoa nibs. And so that was an addition I put in four days ago, and it only stayed in for a night. We tasted it the next morning and said, wow, that is as good as it's going to get, and we yanked it right back out. Um, so when I'm doing flavors, it's tinctures. Some of you might remember that uh, a couple of years ago we had a couple of sessions where we were really involved with the tinctures and guys were talking about that. I find that when I'm doing things like uh, coconut or nuts, that the tincture works really well, especially with coconut. If you want to get the oil off of it, you can put it in a tincture of vodka and then put it in your refrigerator and the oil comes off if you toast, especially if you toast your coconut, then that oil comes off and you can get it off of that before you put it into your beer. Um, for the stout that you just had tonight, I wanted to have some uh, barrel-aged flavor to it. And so I took Jim Beam and I put it in a, a bunch of, uh, I put my um, light spiral oak into the Jim Beam and let it sit for six weeks in there. Then I took it out and dried it. And I've discovered that like two ounces in a five gallon batch for four days really gives enough of that kind of smoky kind of flavor that you're looking for. You have to be kind of careful with that because you can really go overboard. Another thing is tincture, or, or excuse me, extracts. And Sean, correct me one time, that was a couple of years ago at Booth Brothers, I made a watermelon Kolsch and I made my German chocolate cake. And Sean came and said, did you use tincture in this? Or did you use extract? And I said, yeah. And so it's obvious. And, and Patrick, you know, I had that uh, hazelnut. And so, you know, you just have to be really, really careful. So small additions of flavor a little bit at a time to get where you want to go. Lauren. So I think you mentioned that we're taste. What are we tasting right now? We just served. Did you not get the I stout? did. I did. Yeah. I just okay. wanted to make sure everybody knew that's. 
Yeah. This is what you're talking about. um, With that, I have some, oh, the last thing, and I'll get to that. Last thing I was going to mention is with going in and out of your fermenters, your secondary, or your kegs, you know, sanitation is a big deal. And so every time I put anything into a keg, I soak the bag in my star sand, I soak whatever weights in the star sand, you know, just so everything that I'm going to put in there, hold my breath when I open up the keg, you know, that sort of stuff. So I try to keep it as clean as I possibly can. Um, some examples that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, Boysenberry Sorbet was the second place winner at the Five Suits competition. And that had two quarts of boysenberry juice in secondary for 10 days. Then I put two cups of boysenberry sorbet that I had made, and I put that in for five days. And then I put in eight ounces of lactose. I was tasting the whole time, looking for that profile where I got the tartness of the boys and berries that were fresh out of the garden. But I wanted a little softer mouthfeel to it. I wanted to get that taste like a sorbet. I didn't want really creamy. So, you know, every time I added something, I was thinking about that flavor profile that I wanted to do, kind of isolate the flavor and elevate that part of it. Um, German chocolate cake, that ended up having... Um, eight ounces of coconut, eight ounces of pecans, and four ounces of cocoa in secondary for 14 days. And I pulled that out. Then I had eight ounces of coconut, six ounces of pecans in it for nine days. And I pulled that out. Then eight ounces of pecans and an ounce and a half, or two and a half ounces of cocoa for six days. Pulled that out. Then I put in eight ounces of pecans and eight ounces of cocoa nibs just to get it to bump up to that, you know, like you take, Bring up your, your nose and you smell it and you go, yeah, that smells like that cake that I just had for dessert. So anyway, that's what I was looking for. Um, what you just had, I called Strope Sublime. And that is inspired by Pure Project's River of Truth stout that they had. And they just did a big, they just poured stouts one day uh, last week. And it was just awesome. So with that beer, um, it's an imperial stout. And I was kind of inspired. Uh, Brew Your Own magazine had three different guys talk about pastry stouts in one of their their recent editions. And I thought of that and said, okay, yeah, that, that looks good. So in it, it has eight ounces of coconut and secondary for 10 days. And then it had the oak spirals in it for four days. Um, then another eight ounces of coconut for nine days. And I finished up. I've got a friend from Pennsylvania who owns a maple syrup farm. And so he sent out his homemade maple syrup. And I finished that off with 24 ounces of maple syrup in the last two days in, uh, in the fermenter. So, you know, flavor is, to me, it's all about isolating what you want, elevating that, using a tincture if you're getting something that you can extract that out. Um, I did, in the last edition I put into that German chocolate cake, I did not toast the pecan or the cocoa nibs. I wanted a little bit fresher flavor. So, anyway, that's flavor from my perspective. Sean. Um, it's really, so what I've discovered is that and if you've ever put like coconut into um, a beer, it's in a bag and it kind of loses its potency. It's done what it's going to do. I've got everything out of it that I can. So I yank it out and it's just a process of putting something fresher in. So yeah. did that answer your question? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Okay. Very good beer, by the way. Thank you. Yes. You said that there was a certain amount of time that you put those ingredients in for. Yeah, Did you take so them back out again, or what? I, you know what? It's not science for me. It's just kind of going by the seat of my pants. And you know, honestly, when when I was looking at that Heffenweizen, and I was thinking, God, what am I going to do with the Heffenweizen? And, and I looked out in my yard. I had a bumper crop of boysenberries, and I had a bumper crop of papaya. I pureed some of the papaya and made a tincture out of that. That was the, my imperial papaya Heffenweizen that I served that day. And the boysenberry, you know, I, I, I just thought, you know what? 
I'm going to make this kind of into a wheat beer. I, I did a little um, brew in a bag on the stovetop, and I used um, some more wheat malt, um, and I put a little honey malt in that, and then I started to add the boysenberry. I just I have a a lot of boysenberry around, so I had actually juiced the berries, and it was just straight boysenberry juice. Um, you know, you look on a a, a brew website like uh, Beersmith. And you're looking for kind of fruit and, and what they recommend. And it was like a half a gallon of some puree that, you know, I read. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I've got almost that much boysenberry. I can put that in. So, Chris, did you try the boysenberry? Really? Did it turn out? Very cool. That's the cook in me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Greg. There's a little more German chocolate cake if you want it. Okay, I do not have an actual show and tell because carrying this thing was just a little bit more than I could manage. Uh, many of you may recognize this if you've been to Andy's house at some point in time. This is Andy's keezer. And what inspired me to help Andy with this keezer at one time was when I wanted to beer out of it, and it was a spaghetti. You think that looks bad? It was unbelievable, right? Uh, many of you have tried it, right? It's like, you grab a handle, and then you got to figure out which one it goes to. So I said to Andy one time, I said, Andy, you got to do a keezer out of this. He goes, yeah, I was thinking about it for one day. I said, I'm going to do it for you. So it's, it's a pretty interesting project to have a keezer. Some of you guys may be kegerator types. Some are keezer types. I personally have a kegerator uh, because I didn't want to have to lift those kegs full into and out of that thing. I don't know how you do it, but I would. I don't them. lift them full either. Oh, I lift them when they're empty out, and I pump beer into them. Ah, Andy, I'm of too course old to you do. Uh, I was going to say, do you have a pulley system above in the ceiling? No, just that just pump the beer out of the fermenter into the kegs in there, and okay. I pump stuff around. Kegerator, keezer, it is because it's actually a pretty cool project. And it's fun. If any of you have ever done one, you, you don't need a lot of tools to do it. Um, so what I did to make this collar, where you see all the taps in it, is just use a sliding chop saw with, an ang with a miter on it and cut the angles of the wood. You got to make sure if you're going to do something like this, though, you got to have pretty dry wood because it will twist on you. And if it twists on you, and Jim, you know what I'm talking about, Getting it to join up is not going to work very well. So I have a, uh, I have a little, I have a tool that'll make a slot in each side of the angle that I can put a little biscuit into. It's a biscuit cutter, if you know about woodworking, so I could get a good joint on it. And I, so I went to Andy's house and I measured it. And then I had to build it kind of sight unseen from my measurement and hope to God that it was going to fit. And Jim, you remember, because I think you were at the house when I fit it onto the machine before I finished doing all the build of it. And it, it miraculously it fit, because I don't usually do stuff that well. Jack, tell, tell us why it's important to, to have a collar. Tell us why, why you have a collar on these. So the collar is needed to be able to provide the height that you need to put your taps into it, right? You don't want to cut holes in the, in the, the freezer. This is made from a standard chest freezer that you can buy on Craigslist, you can buy it at the store new if you want to. Um, but it gives you that height to enable you to put the taps into it. So it's, it's, it's a pretty cool project. I, I, I found it by, frankly, looking at, at YouTube <laughs> like everything else I do. Um, so we, we, we put the, I painted it up to match Andy's. I asked him if he wanted it to be stained because you see some projects on the web and they're beautiful wood, pro I mean like exotic woods. And he goes, no, I just want it white. So I painted it with, a, with appliance white and I put a lot of coats of paint on it because I wanted it to be really 
hold well to be able to provide also some insulation quality. Um, this picture, as you can see, uh, is the insulation. So all you gotta do is just buy a little bit of that uh, freezer type insulation, this two-sided mylar insulation. What I, what I didn't think about was, and when, when Andy was buying the, uh, what do you call those things, the, the shanks, he bought them a little bit too short. So when, when, I was, when we went to install at Andy's house, because I brought this thing up and, and I had a truck at the time, which I missed dearly. Um, I don't have it anymore, but we ended up having, I had to kind of like gnarl out these corners so we could s tighten the shanks on them. And Andy was, I, I, have a, I have a kegerator at home, and I wish I'd have thought of this when I had mine, because he put magnets on the back of his trays. So that makes it super easy and super clean. That's why it looks like that. It's incredible. And, and when you're doing the collar, this is the other thing that I realized is you can reuse the holes in the top. So when you build one of these, you gotta take the top off. You gotta remove the hinges. Put a seal around the bottom of silicone, a lot of it. I mean, a lot of it. And it was nasty, messy, taking it out, but it worked out okay. So we took the hinges, put the hinges back on. You need to have the height so that you can get the hinges on. These are all new, like pneumatic hinges, very tight and hard to mess with. Uh, I put screws back in. I think these were the old holes. I think I only had to do the new holes for the top into the wood. This is his uh, temperature sensor. Pretty simple deal there. And I just asked Andy how many taps he wanted to have in it, so I drilled the holes for the taps to fit, to fit his shanks. And that was it. It's, it's a pretty simple project, and it didn't take a ton of time, uh, and it, but it was really fun for me to do it because I like making stuff. And it was, um, it was really great for me to be the recipient. <laughs> And, 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 you yeah, know, because I mean, I, I did. And, Andy's been such a great inspiration for the club, and he's done so many great things for it. So I thought it was one thing I could kind of give back for all of his, all of his work and all of his effort. And it, and it was really kind of a fun project. So, yeah, questions, Todd? He, I think, Andy, you put him outside, right? I put him outside. You can put him inside, but you know, you got more space if you leave him on the outside. You know, and you can. You've got that wood. The whole idea with the wood on the collar is that you can drill whatever you want in there. You can drill, put holes in there. Uh, oh, the other thing, the, the seal, uh, what, this, this, the seal from the, the top of the, K, of, the, of the freezer still acts as a perfectly good seal when you're closing it down. So you don't need to mess with that. It's, it's a pretty cool project, pretty simple. And you, you end up having a really cool way to serve your beer. Chris? So, so, so for those of you on Zoom, Andy uses a 50-pound a tank, and he straps it on. Of course he does. With uh, air, what, what are you aircraft? Uh, earthquake. earthquake protection, so that it doesn't fall do fall over, because that, that would be bad deal. Of fifty pound tank, <laughs> CO two fell over. Yeah, I I love this. I think it's really cool. I see you got a stout. You got a stout tap now. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Any uh, yes. All, all I did was do the the build part. Andy, do you use a fan inside? Oh no! So just where you place the it, it, where you place the probe can make a difference. So if you place it in a corner, that's not a good a good place. You can you can basically regulate the temperature by where you put the probe. I try to put it someplace that's going to be in the middle, up up a little bit off the ground. Yeah, I've I've read about using the fans to try to keep the air moving and keep it consistent throughout. I've never done it in mine, Chris.
Yeah, I, I think, so, so Chris was out talking about humidity control, and I agree with you, because you, you can get a little bit of mold and mildew on the outside of your unit if you don't apply some type of humidity control to the unit. So I, I think it's an absolutely great idea. I don't know, Andy, what do you do for humidity there, control? There's two things that I've done. One of them is I, I hold the temperature very low, and there's actually part of it that, that, that sort of freezes up, and it just collects, so all the moisture just collects up. And basically, then when I want to thaw it out, I can thaw it out and get rid of the ice that's there. That's one thing I've done. The other thing is I have I just have a uh, a towel I can throw in there that'll just absorb moist moisture, and then I'll take it out and let it dry out and throw another towel in. So, various different ways to do it. Yeah, Greg. Could you, couldn't you do, so Greg puts a, a his sensor, tapes it to a can of Arizona tea or whatever, but couldn't you also put that in the liquid so that you're measuring or sensing the temperature of the liquid inside, not the air? Close enough, right? Cool. Any other questions? Yes. So fan, good idea for the kegerator, for sure. Especially ones that have a, if you have towers on them, those ones kind of need, yeah, do you need, a, do you need fans for those? For sure. Any think, other questions? So fans, really good idea, especially for those tower kegerators. Out of tower, it comes out of the out of the your out of the cold table, box. Out of the then box, yeah. you should you should have a fan on it. I think David? we think we need to last question. Last yeah, question. Dave? It's too late for that. <laughs> It's that too late ship for that. Already sailed. You're right. The watermelons, that. I think things like all, that. We've all felt that when those of us that have them. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Good job, Jack. Okay. Uh, up next, uh, Chris Banker and Sean Bush is on deck. And then we have Sean Bush, and then after that, Justin, and then and then we're uh, done with this part of the program. Right here. Right here. Hey, so I brought my homebrew keg washer for washing corny kegs, and it can also be adapted to, to wash carboys and whatever you want. Uh, so it's made out of Basically, things you can get on Amazon and from Home Depot. So I've got it set up. I can do a demo. So basically, the main part of this is a half horsepower sump pump. You can get these on Amazon for about $35 or $40. And then you, it comes with the black part of the threads on there, and you adapt that with an adapter from Home Depot to PVC. You go up to a 45 degree angle and then you split it off at the T there or the cross to two hoses that cover your ball lock disconnects or it could be pin lock if you use pin lock. And then it goes to another 45 and to this threaded connection for your pipe. And this pipe can be a piece of PVC drilled with a bunch of holes to spray out. It can be uh, any type of nozzle at the top. I've got a spray ball on here that rotates when it's turned on. And uh, so you can take this part off and use different lengths for different vessels. If you've got shorter kegs, you can 
make versions for shorter kegs. You can make one for a carboy. So, so I'll get this rigged up one second. All right, so we're inverting the keg on the top of this keg washer and hooking up the ball locks for the gas and beverage lines. Turning on the sump pump. And it is absolutely doing what it does. So the, the sump pump comes with this, uh, this float valve on it, and you can use this just as your switch. So you, uh, you can put a wire on that and hang it from your keg, or I just have it next to uh, something I can rest it on. As long as it's held up, it's running. And I'll just set this up and let it run for a good 10 or 15 minutes, ideally, with PBW in it, and that'll get it nice and warm, and then after I can do a whole set of kegs. I'll rinse one, stick it on here, let it run for a little bit, uh, take it off, put the next one on, rinse the rinse it out after the PBW. I can crank through a bunch of kegs, especially once it's nice and warm. Maybe five minutes a keg is enough. Uh, so it makes it really easy to crank through a whole bunch of kegs in an evening and have a bunch of kegs ready to go. Could be another option for a project day. Hmm. And <laughs> uh, this was just with water, but I'd normally use uh, PBW mix. And I'll have an email out once I sit down at my chair with the build info that I sent out two or three years ago. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so the question was whether it was going through the C CIP ball as well as the post, and yes. And you can run it, you know, since the ball locks have the valves on them, if you don't have those hooked up to the keg, that's just going through the spray ball or whatever you have on there. So it's basically doing everything at once. It's cleaning your dip tubes as well as the inside of the keg through the spray ball, and it's a, just a single rinse that covers it all. You never have to worry about pulling your dip tubes to clean the keg. It makes it very convenient and easy, and you can make this whole thing for less than a hundred bucks. Any other questions? All right, Sean Bush. Yes, Sean's up, and Justin is on deck. Okay, so a lot of preparation went in today's uh, talk. I, uh, I sent a picture at 3 o'clock today to Lauren. Lauren, you're a good man. So... This talk was about fermentation control, but you know, actually after listening to the chats here, really, it's more along the lines of, I'll do this so you don't have to crane your neck. It's more the evolution of a brewer, because I was thinking about where I started and the takeaways from today's talks. Like we talked about Herms. So far, my favorite takeaway is Jacques, just the phrase, so I could get a good joint, uh, quote unquote, he said it. But um, you know, first when we start brewing, we're following recipes. And then, uh, you know, we might tweak the recipe a little bit. Then we realize sanitation is important. Eventually along the line, we don't clean something quite right. And then we realize this is really important, so we start cleaning. Um, after that, 
we tweak the recipe some more. And then I think when you have your recipe, there's two different directions where you can go and make a big difference in the quality of your beer. The first one is fermentation temperature control. You could take the same beer, I take double uh, White Labs 001, pretty much the standard yeast. You ferment that out at 63 degrees or 72 degrees, you're going to get a wildly different beer. That 63 degrees is going to be super clean. I won't call it lager-like, but it's going to be way cleaner and way, I don't know, I prefer it versus the 72. 72, you're going to get those esters a lot more fruity. But I've played with that a little bit. The other place where I think you could really change your beer is going to be in the mash temperature. You mash something out at 148, 149, you're creating a lot of short chain sugars. And that's going to lead to a drier beer versus 154, 156. Then you're getting something a little chewy or a little bit more mouthfeel. So for me, fermentation temperature control is kind of fun. Um, the, <laughs> there's a lot of stickers on a freezer in the background. That, that freezer, that's freezer number two. Freezer number one was given to me, and I didn't realize what a good deal that was. Freezer number one I gave to somebody in the club, and I forget his name. It had a lot of stickers too. Freezer number one was horrible when it came to energy efficiency. But what it did is when the temperature controller said turn off, boom, it turned off and then it pretty much let all the um, heat back in, or you can say the cold out if you want, but it really let the heat in. Um, and then it started up again. This freezer was a floor model at Home Depot and I was watching it, it was like 600 and something bucks. But then it was sitting there, and it was sitting there, and it was getting dings and collecting dings. And then they marked it down to like 300. And I went in there and offered them 150 bucks, and they took it. Um, but this one now, we talked about. You heard about ink birds. Ink bird. It. This will also. This does cooling and heating. And with this freezer, what I found is when it turns on and when it turns off. I see the temperature drop down a little bit versus my horribly inefficient uh, freezer. When it turned off, the temperature just stayed there. Um, what I have is inside a fermenter inside there, I have a thermal well. And then the, the probe for the ink bird just sits inside the thermal well. It works out really well as far as you want to know what the temperature is doing because when the yeast are propagating, they're creating heat. Now in front of the freezer, because the freezer right now has got um, 10 gallons of Baltic. Oh, the other reason I chose this freezer, I could fit four big mouth bubbler fermenters in there. Um, so, but you have to choose four beers. Well, I do 10 gallon batches a lot, so you have to choose two beers, two brew days of the same. Now in front of this is what I found works for pretty much all of my ales and Kolsch's. And it's a simple ice chest with a water bath. And what the water bath is doing is it's giving you a thermal mass. So temperatures don't change so much. I brewed that beer last night and I forgot to buy ice at Costco. So when I was done chilling, I got it down to 72 degrees. And I wanted to ferment that at about 63 degrees. So I just grabbed a whole bunch of frozen bottles of water and stuff out of the freezer, threw them in there, emptied the ice tray from our freezer in the house, threw it in there, and I was done um, doing this at 5.30 at night, and at 7.30 at night, it was down at 60 degrees. So now slowly, it's going to ease up. And what I found in the middle of summer, when it gets as hot as it gets in Oceanside, not too far from here, in the morning before work, I'll drop a frozen bottle in there. And when I get home, check it out. And before I go to bed, I'll drop another uh, frozen half liter bottle. That keeps temperature control plus or minus one degree for fermentation. So that's pretty cool. Now, come winter time, when it gets into the frigid coldness of Southern California, it's an aquarium heater. And I just set the aquarium, I put the aquarium heater in there. And with the Inkbird, it has, well, different models. This one has cooling and heating. So if I want to maintain a certain temperature, the aquarium heater will do that for me. It works. Um, there's definitely more high tech stuff, but I've had three ice chests going um, with six fermenters at the same time, plus the freezer going, 
and being able to maintain fermentation control and all that. Um, now, the evolution of a brewer, when I first started homebrewing, I was in Hawaii, and the local homebrew shop guy was right there with Charlie Papazian. Ah, don't worry about it, just do it. So my uh, pantry was a constant 73 degrees, and I did loggers in there. They were not good. <laughs> live and learn, live and learn. But, um, you know, some of the stuff we talked about tonight that was ringing bells, um, the Herms, I use the Inkbird to control, uh, where, there you are. I use the Inkbird to control the pump on my Herm system. I manually control the flame for my HLT. So I ramp it up to about 175, and then I turn it down real low, and then the Inkbird will turn the pump on, and the thermal well goes right into the mash tun, for what it's worth. Not really fermentation, that's mash. And then, Todd, you'd asked about what temperature. I usually run that HLT around 170 because that's my sparge water. We don't want too hot because we don't want the astringency. So, and then, you know, the very last thing, and we were just talking about the evolution of a brewer. This is all over the place. Um, I'd say after you do fermentation control, then mash control, then the next thing after that is worrying about your water quality. Because that's another place where you can really influence a uh, beer. As I found out, I made a Pilsner uh, when I lived in Clovis. Turned out great. I made that same exact beer nine months later, and I poured it out. And then I called the water department because I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. And the water department told me, oh, yeah, th this time of the year, we switch from river water, surface water, to all groundwater. And the groundwater up there is outstanding for IPAs. Lots of sulfates. Not good for Pilsners. But anyway... I just kind of thought about that as you grow and as you just think about brewing. I mean, we do tweak stuff, we change stuff, we play with fermentation temperature. And uh, my wife, I'm going away for a week next week on vacation. My wife's going to actually be dropping frozen water bottles in a couple ice chests. Bless her heart. Um, yeah, she said as long as I'm making a beer she likes. She doesn't do IPAs, but she's got, that's a, oh, that by the way is, um, it's uh, my retirement red ale. Yes. Today's my first day of retirement, and I'm happy about that. Yeah. So that's cool. But uh, that's pretty much all I got. Um, any questions? You know what? I did not shave this morning. So tomorrow I'll look like Patrick. <laughs> Maybe not. Patrick. How long are you just sober on your first day of retirement? I haven't got home yet. <laughs> got to drive. Yeah, Thank you. They, well, we, and I don't know if you all have been to Costco, but they do have the uh, advent calendar of beers. Well, when we get home, I'm gone, gone for a week, so we got to drink in advance. <laughs> cool. What's that? Oh, no, that is not mine. So the retirement red will show up in January's meeting, probably. And that Baltic one will show up in March's. Cool. Have you tried drafting your fermenter, like both future, the amazing, because they kind of You know, I thought about that, and I've heard about that in places where, like, say, Arizona, and people have had fans going on because of evaporative cooling. You know, you can see the water's like four inches from the top. And normally I have two fermenters in there, I haven't had the need because it doesn't get that hot and the frozen water bottles, a little goes along once you get it in the temperature zone you want. So like right now, I dropped it a little bit below where I wanted to be and I'm just letting it ease up with my goal of being 63 degrees uh, to 65. I'm gonna keep it in that range. And tomorrow I'm brewing a Kolsch, or a, sorry, a cop booster, but I'm gonna hold that one at 65. So that'll go into this ice chest when I pull some water out. And then I'll have another ice chest that I'm doing at 68. But yeah, no, I have heard about the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that fermenter right there? That, oh, we got to go. We got to go. But that fermenter, they quit making them. So if you can find them, grab them because they have handles built into them. Super cool. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you, everybody.
All right, I didn't really prepare for this too much, but um, I'm Justin, if you don't know. And uh, look, I got a slide, that's pretty cool. Um, so I was gonna be talking about barrel aging beers. Uh, got a, about three barrels in my house, I consistently just keep them full of different beers or meads, ciders, stuff like that. Uh, the one that just went around was my uh, English barley wine. Uh, I think it was the third use on one of those small five gallon barrels. So I got these at 117 West uh, sometime back when people were, we were getting a bunch of, when we were doing the distilling event there, they also were selling some barrels, so I picked one up. I uh, wasn't sure really where to go with this, but I guess one of the questions that usually comes up is why would you wanna buy, spend all the money on a small five gallon barrel versus just adding some oak chips or cubes or spirals? And I think if you just want some wood character, I think those things are a great way to go. It keeps everything simple and you don't have to deal with barrels. Um, the one thing that a barrel will do though is it'll give you some micro oxygen. Um, it'll, it'll oxidize a little bit the beer, but it's like micro oxidized. So you get this nice kind of round character from uh, aging inside of a barrel. Uh, now I haven't done a lot, of, I'm not talking about too much the big barrels, the big barrel products are great too. Um, but what I have is just little five gallon barrels. And when you put beer into a five gallon barrel, it instead of like a big, like a wine barrel or a, a whiskey barrel, it has a lot more contact with the sides of the barrel and you're gonna get more of that oxidized character from the micro oxidization uh, leaching into the barrel. So you really only need it to be in there for maybe like two to three weeks on a first use. You're gonna get a, a huge bourbon character if you, it's a bourbon barrel or whatever kind of spirits were in it before. Uh, like second use, I usually go a bit longer, maybe six weeks, five, six weeks, maybe even longer. It kind of depends on the barrel and the condition it was in. And then, it, for example, on this one, this was the third use. I don't remember if I had cheated and topped the barrel back up with whiskey at some point before this beer. Because um, that's another thing you can do as a home brewer that the pros can't do. So th when they're done with their barrels, they're, they're just done with the barrel and or it becomes a neutral barrel. But as a home brewer, you can always add whiskey character back by just soaking whiskey in it. And one of the other cool things about doing that is it also changes the flavor of the whiskey. So when you take your whiskey out of the barrel or whatever spirit you're using, you're gonna get some character from the beer that was in there before or even some more oak character from the barrel. Uh, let's see what else I got here. Uh, Andy knows a ton about barrels too because he's got these giant barrels in his backyard that we do for Society Lambic. And those are pretty neutral at this point, I believe. So another thing you can do if you use a barrel, maybe usually around three times it seems is where they start to kind of just become neutral. Um, you can just turn it into a sour barrel and, and use it for that. Uh, other options if you don't like sour beers, I, haven't, I don't have any sour barrels myself, especially five gallon, because I think the one downside to a five gallon is that you get evaporation too and you don't have a lot of beer in there, so you gotta keep it full. And if you're doing a sour, it's gonna be, tend to be in there for a long time, so you're gonna have to top it off, but not many people are gonna brew, maybe top it off with some wort from another beer, but you're probably not gonna brew like a half gallon of beer to like top off your barrel. So that's the reason I haven't used mine for sours. Uh, one thing I have found them very useful for is aging meads. So after I use a barrel three, four times, uh, and it's kind of done at that point as far as the characteristics I'm getting from the barrel, I find that using these little five gallon barrels, I can put a meat in there. Maybe it's a little hot or has a little, you know, something's not quite there. It maybe, I don't know, it wasn't super kept, kept up on the nutrient additions to my mead. Um, so any kind of like small defects or maybe something that you just want to age out, these barrels work magic. They're like, it's like you can put something in there that's hot, put it into that barrel and it gets that, that micro, uh, micro oxidization from the, the air. And, um, yeah, it really turns meads around, makes them nice. That's probably like my favorite way to, to reuse them. Uh, let's see. Oh, I was reading something online about a guy that actually takes the barrel back apart and he'll scrape it out after a bunch of uses and then he'll rechar it. He says he just throws like some spirits in there, lights match, <laughs> lets it go. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would do it that way. Um, I haven't tried that. I've just been happy. I might do it at some point just to see how it goes, probably in a concrete area of my yard. <laughs> um, so there's another way to do that. Uh, I know Canteon, they take like a chain and they throw it into the barrel and they have this like machine that shakes the barrel and the chain just beats up the whole inside of the barrel and then they'll flush it out and 
rechar it. So they might be able to do something like that with a five gallon barrel as a homebrew, maybe just a piece of a chain or something metal on a, a drill. Just whip it around inside the barrel. That might be an easy way to do that. You probably wouldn't even have to take it apart. You know, you could get it in through the, the bunghole. Uh, some other information about barrels. Let's see. The one thing that's always a pain on these little barrels is getting the beer out of the barrel. So uh, most of the people here, especially Lauren, likes to keep that oxygen away from his beer. And it's not so easy when you're opening to the barrels like the size of a quarter to get like make a contraption to purge, like pressurize the barrel or put, push CO2 into it to get your beer out. So I'm pretty lazy about that when it comes to the barrel stuff I do. And I just use a stainless racking cane, the kind of little marble in it that you can kind of shake. And I, I, I do all the stuff with the keg, I, I flush it. And so I'm trying to eliminate as much as possible, but just a lot easier on life when uh, you just set the barrel down, rack your beer out. Uh, let's see, I, think, I don't think I have a whole lot more than that. Um, oh, I can go for uh, by cleaning between beers. So you have options, uh, depending on what you're doing with the barrel. You can, you know, if you're doing a, maybe a Belgian double and then you're gonna do a Belgian quad, you can just basically rack the beer out and pour your next beer on top of it. If you don't want, if you're going from a Belgian beer to maybe a stout, I'd probably do it the other way around. But if you're gonna do that or switch styles, it's good to clean the barrel out. I usually just throw some boiling water in there, shake it up, dump it out, and move on to the next beer. But you do wanna keep it moist somehow between, you don't wanna let your barrel dry out between the beers. So either filling it back up with whiskey, if I'm just gonna be sitting for a while and I don't have something to put in it, that usually works. No, I just, I usually get a Costco handle, maybe two. And, because, uh, you know, they're, the, yeah, the Kirkland whiskey is okay. And yeah, I just push it in there. And what I'll do is I'll just rotate the barrel slowly uh, throughout the week or month or whatever. As long as there's something in there keeping it moist, you're usually okay. Yeah, and, and it's just, it's a five gallon barrel. So if I see people do this with like, uh, like full size whiskey barrels and they're putting like a handle or two in and they're just trying, they just kind of rotate it around. So I figure if you're putting a handle or two into a five gallon barrel, you might not even need to rotate it around that much. But and you want to coat the barrel if you're going to want that whiskey taste. But yeah, keep them keep them wet. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed the barley wine. Uh, it was about ten percent. It was I think it was like nine point seven actually, and it was a third use on the barrel. Like I said, and I'm still pulling a little bit of character in there, but it's obviously not as intense as it would be if it was a first use. Very tasty. Thank you. Thank you.